Rahul Kabir from Punch Out Boxing. Delighted to be here with a legend of the sport, Mervyn Turner, here at your gym, Shamrock Boxing Gym in Luton. Thanks for the welcome. How are you? Very well, thanks. I don't know about legend, but old, I agree with. <laughs> and uh, you're most welcome. Oh, the pleasure's all mine. So, uh, you have, you're one of these uh, powerful figures in the sport that people don't know about. So, you do a lot. Uh, but let's start here with this gym. Um, when did you open it up? Um, and uh, yeah, what's your reasoning behind it? Um, well, the gym was actually open. Um, we come from Ireland originally, and my father and I both boxed in Ireland. He wanted to be a top, top amateur and professional. And when we come over to the UK, uh, he opened and uh, he helped out in the boxing gym first of all, and then he opened the first boxing gym in Luton. The big Irish community here, anyway. So um, I then started working with him. Uh, came, I went out of boxing, came out of his business, and back into boxing. And when he passed, I took over the gym, and really I run it as a community gym in his name. For I don't want to sound like goody goody or anything like that, but the gym is here in, in, this, in the centre of Luton, and. Uh, Luton's got his, his problems and uh, there's always a need for, for boxing gyms. So I've really kept it alive for sentimental reasons and also for the community um, that we serve in, in this locality. Yeah, doing God's work, absolutely. Well, um, just just in rewinding about, back a bit, um, what was your own boxing career like? Uh, was you uh, ever a pro? Did you have much of an amateur career? I boxed as an amateur back in Ireland and never turned pro. I had the opportunity to do so when we come to the UK. I came here quite young and uh, we boxed down at a gym called Boxall Motors. Um, it was a fantastic gym there, some great trainers, good boxers come out of there. And Luton has a history of, of good boxers. You know, some, someone said to me the other day, well, Luton, there's not many boxers in Luton, but if you look at the history, there's been some fantastic boxers from Luton. The current boxers, you know, we, we have our share. So, yeah, so the amateur career, I uh, travelled a lot from Brett of Ireland as we used to do in them days. Um, you know, boxing was very different back then. You, you, you just told there's a show on Saturday and you met at the club and off you went. And, you walked into a room and there was a matchmaker there who pulled two of you together, put you back to back, and if the height and the weight looked right, that was a match. You were always hoping you'd get the match. You'd go to all these shows, always hoping you'd get the match. There we go. Wow, so you've seen the evolution of the sport quite a lot over the years, uh, I, I'd imagine. Boxing's changed from them throughout the years, you know. Um, as well as being in the sport earlier, I became a fan of boxing before I came into the business of boxing. As I said, I went out of boxing, my father continued, I went into business, did, did reasonably well there. Um, now I'm at an age where my sons run the business, so I, I, I get to do a bit more of what I love to do, and boxing is what we love to do. So. In one way or another, I've, I've done many, many roles in boxing. I've really enjoyed my time in boxing. You know, it's it's a young man's sport, but I'm hanging on with grim teeth, thinking I'm still of that age. Um, but yes, it's changed tremendously. It's unrecognisable from back then. Sometimes that's life, isn't it? That every sport has changed, every society has changed. So you would expect the evolution of boxing to change. There's some great things happening. Tell us what are the things you like, the change that you like most, uh, and things you dislike the most in terms of the changes compared to when you started out. Um, things I like the most, I think, I think the safety aspect. Um, boxing has got a lot safer. Um, reduction in rounds. It's a shame my age for going back. Added the fourth rope to the ring. Previously three, and it's got dangers with that. Um, British Boxing Board of Control, as much as everybody moans about them, and myself included, in one way or another, I, you know, you, you have to tilt your hat to, to, 
for those guys um, since you know the, the travesty of, of Michael Watson things have changed a lot um, so the safety of the sport I'm I'm 100% that's, that's a great thing to happen the sport has it's still not mainstream football blah blah blah, blah but it's it's held in high regard and uh, you know some of these guys are interesting guys like money with the dream of you know uh, champions of old uh, left handless half the time um, if you look back at the last couple of that but, you know it's just uh, it's a deal um, it's it's viewing figures it's uh, you know you've got pay-per-view which um, Eddie Hearn sort of came in and was, was a master of that. Um, Frank Warren's done extremely well, you know, he's, he's, he's probably, I would say, maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I, I think the best promoter. You know, certainly in terms of building a fight, uh, a fighter, sorry, I don't think there's anybody better than Frank Warren. He knows exactly how to build a patient. He's also a fan of the sport, that really helps. Um, but yeah, he, he can build a fighter and he's built so many champions. People have written that man off so many times, you know, for one reason or another. Um, but he keeps coming back with champions. So anyway, I got off the subject a little bit. Uh, what I don't like about the sport now, I think now, um, you know, you've got, you've got a lot of people entering the sport that don't actually know the sport of boxing. And... Um, you know, when I got my promoter's license, for instance, I had to shadow a, a promoter before I could even apply and say, yes, I shadowed, I did this show, I did this show, da da da. Um, seconds license, you know, you, you really weren't put up for that until you'd been in the gym, around the trainers, learned the trade, like an apprenticeship, um, and you come through and, and you get qualified, you know. Nowadays, it's like, you know, a driving test, you get your license and you go and learn to do what you're supposed to know in the first place. So there's a lot of people out there, you know, that don't know boxing. The reason I don't like that is, you know, you're dealing with young men that can be influenced very easily. And this is a dangerous sport. Okay, injuries and so forth happen in all sports. Um, but you don't put a young man in the ring unless you don't have to. That side of boxing, I, 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 I don't like. You know, you've got all sorts of people just coming into boxing because they want to come in. They get clickbait and they do this, they do that. I don't think it's particularly good for the sport. Yes, a wider audience is great. I'm not against influencer boxing at all. I think, you know, I think Eddie Hearn on uh, last week summed it up. It wasn't for him. He did um, Logan Paul two. He didn't start influencer boxing off, but um, it wasn't for him. Uh, however, there is a market for influencer boxing, and it's a big market. And people say, well, you know, you're you're on the professional side, how could you possibly say that? Well, there's an awful lot of professionals around that, that ring at Wembley and, and uh, at the O2. When you take the O2, you fill the O2, they were there at 7 o'clock, it didn't leave till 11 o'clock. You know, if you Joshua the other night, you know, not, I'm not just saying Joshua, any professional fight, you don't get that audience participation like you do in the box. And if we're getting getting this, the kids off the street, getting them interested in boxing, and they're coming and spending some money in our industry, it can only be a good thing. We have to be careful that professional boxing doesn't get diluted because of it. There are two very, very different aspects. You've got professional boxing and you've got sports entertainment. You know, and as long as you keep it like that, and if, you know, if, if they get ahead of themselves and want to become a, a pro and make it like the pros, then it will fall flat on its face. It won't last. But as influence of boxing, it's, it can only be good to, to get these kids off the street, 
do something to do it has to be boxing it's sports entertainment boxing. no problem yeah I uh, fully uh, echo your sentiments there um, but I mean you have moved with the times uh, you understand the importance of things like social media getting people like me over here to try and encourage your fights to get their names out there um, Tell us about this uh, sort of Romanian contingent, and I understand you've got uh, you've got links all over the world in this sport. All over the world, um, boxing is a small small industry, so we deal with people from many many different walks of life in different countries. Um, I've got three Romanian guys here at the moment: Romanian guys, Polish guys, Pakistan, India, Thailand. Whatever this gym is open to me. Um, it just so happens at the moment I've got three very good uh, professionals in the gym training at the moment. Um, we have uh, very good connections over there. And, um, you know, the sport is growing over there. But like all sort of countries, it's taken, it's taken a while. You know, so they have to come out of the, the country and go to other places. And I'm very blessed to have two very exceptional talented boxers here. Yeah, um, it's fair to say Mihai probably is likely to be the one with the highest profile because of his heavyweight background. Uh, I, don't, I don't know when you last fight, you said he'd probably go for bridge weight, but uh, could he be the, uh, that? I know you're not in this for the money, but the golden ticket if he eventually goes up to heavyweight and sort of rekindle some of their amateur rivalry. I don't know. Golden ticket, I mean, you know, we, we're in this sport because we love the sport. The money, if you do things right, money will come. As far as Mihal's concerned, he's put his time in, he's, he's a tremendous amateur, and I hope and pray he has the opportunity to be as successful in the pros as he, as he has been in the amateur. Now he's boxed everybody in the you know, Go through the list of sort here and Otto O'Reilly and the fighter for the world title. Of course he boxed AJ. Um, that's been as much a, cri a, a crippling effect because of course AJ is a phenomenal name, phenomenal boxer. So Everybody wants to to take that aspect and that clickbait and make make something of it. They were both young men. Uh, AJ was very young at the time and coming into the sport, learning his trade. And in amateurs, you lose. You, you know, you win some, you lose some. The house lost some. But in terms of the man himself, he's as tough as any. Yeah, a move down to Bridge away, I think, would suit him. Um, that's not to say he won't fight in, in heavyweight. He is a heavy. Um, but bridge away, yes, there are opportunities there we'll take. Um, and I think uh, you having interviewed the guy, you know he'll take any fight. It's, it's not a problem for him to take this fight. So, um, you know, he's got a world of experience there that, that will come through. Just on the subject of Bridgeweight, uh, as someone who knows this sport, uh, what's your view on that? Um, I know certain other coaches, like Joe Gallagher, for example, made a good point. Says we really need Bridgeweight to be between light heavyweight and cruiserweight because the small heavyweights have already proven they can beat big heavyweights, none more so than Alexander Usyk. I mean, would you agree with, him with that? Was it is it a superfluous division? I would no. I wouldn't say. I don't think Joe said it was a superfluous uh, division. I think the, the sentiments are absolutely spot on. I think they just got it a little bit wrong. Um, going back as a chairman, um, cruiserweight was always thirteen stone eight, and they moved it up to fourteen four. Well, if you look at all of the weight divisions, the light heavy at twelve stone seven, and you jump to fourteen four. So it's a huge jump. So, in my opinion, humble as it is, I think you should have gone back to 13 stone 8 in the, as a cruiserweight, put in another division, division as they have at cruiserweight, 
maybe a, a slightly smaller weight, and then you've got a heavy match. And I think that, that would have made things a lot better. So I don't think it's a purpose because there's a lot of people out there. Good boxers just can't compete with the fight. So, I mean, you know, take AJ, who has trouble with small men. He's going to prove me wrong, of course, but, but um, you know, I'm glad to see him train. I'm glad to see him win by knockout the other night. Um, and I hope now he, he, that gives him the confidence to move forward. But no, going back to your original question, I, I don't think it's a superfluous weight uh, division. I just think they've got it a little bit wrong. Um, but it was the WBC, so the WBC aren't, you know, everybody hasn't followed them. So they're the only ones with the bridge of weight. I would have liked to have seen them all talk and get together and, and boxing as a whole, which never seems to happen. And, um, you know, put that, that weight division in between um, light heavy and, and cruiser. And maybe get rid of, you know, the, the lighter weights, get rid of a couple of divisions there because, you know, you've got two pound difference. It's, it's a crazy situation. So um, I think boxing board I believe the British boxing board and, and maybe even Europe um, stopped doing one of the titles I think it was a fly or super fly because they were so close and all the fights were done at a weight so yeah I, I think we need something another aspect I want your view on is um, this modern phenomenon of fighters staying in the amateurs very late so get, you're getting fighters turning pro in there Thirties, but, but then at the other end you get people trying to turn pro with minimal amateur or no amateur experience. Uh, Campbell Hatton was an example of one. A lot of people saying, "Why didn't he's, he's young? Why didn't he stay <laughs> stay an amateur for a couple of more years? Just get more of his fundamentals on point instead of going straight into high profile pro fights and all the criticism that comes with it." Yeah, that's part of what I, I, I alluded to earlier on about the changes in boxing and um, you know the clickbait. Um, you, you're getting amateurs turning too soon. Um, Campbell could have done with some lower profile fights or lower entry into to, to boxing. I thought he'd done very well in his last fight, by the way. Um, so he's learning. He's got good teachers, obviously. Uh, heroes of, the, of and, and true legends of the sport, um, and his father and, and his uncle. Uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of kids out there now that look at the bright lights and they don't see the reality of, of professional boxing. Not just in this country, but worldwide. You know, um, the Campbell Hatton's coming at a certain level and they're earning good money because of the pedigree and who they are. And, they get that, that door open. Nothing wrong with that. That's, that's how life is. But what it does do, it gets other kids turning over way, way, way too soon before they're ready. And almost ruining their careers because they come in and they get disillusioned. You know, they, they think they're going to earn loads of money. And of course, we all know at the bottom end of boxing, it's not professional. You know, the definition of professional is that you earn. 100% of your income in what you do. I think many boxers you can say that. So we actually do have semi pro at that level. So, yeah, um, the other end, uh, there are cases, and we've got one in the house, I think stay too long. Uh, there are a few other notable examples and, and many others besides. But they do stay too long in the amateurs and then find a transition into. So they're two different sports. They really are, you know. You've got table tennis and tennis, you know, you've got two bats, two 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 bowls and, and, and one ball, but it varies with the depths. And I believe that professional and amateur is like that. You need that time to transition and the trains around and good experience of the program. And then you can go somewhere. But now they've got their mates around them. You know, this, that, and the other front in there, and, and, and but 
they want that bright five minute click bait. The longevity and the spawn. It's not just not there. Thank you. Uh, talking of uh, taking people places, uh, you are about to embark back on a program of uh, promoting uh, a lot more shows, starting right here local, down the road in Bedford. Uh, tell us, what can we expect in the uh, near future from your promotional outlook? Yeah, we, we never really stopped promoting, we just, obviously with COVID and then um, it became very difficult, and it is difficult at small hall level to, to promote. So a lot of good promoters out there at small hall level. Um, without small hall boxing, don't have the, the top end of boxing. And unfortunately in this sport, they don't get enough recognition. There isn't the sort of hierarchical situation you have in, in, in uh, football where money comes down from the top and gets uh, put into the, the, the smaller promotions. And, you know, it's a very individual sport, and because of that, small hall boxing suffers. And now, with the rising costs, you know, everybody's putting the costs up. Uh, the board have just put a, a lot of costs up license fees, you know, the, the, the fees for championships that didn't have fees before. So, doctors' fees have gone up tremendously, outrageously, in my opinion. Um, we're led by by the, the medical side of it these days, uh, and we're paying the price for that. And and none so much in in small hall. And uh, so we've got to do something. So yeah, we're embarking on a few shows, and we're going to dip our toe back in the water. We're starting back on um, October the thirteenth, uh, down the road from here in, in Bedford, where we promoted before, uh, putting on the local ads, and hopefully bringing the champions through. And giving other people the opportunity to jump on those, sh those shows. Um, they'll be streamed out on uh, the AOZAT channel. And we're now embarking on uh, doing a few more shows a, a year. How many? I can't say at the moment, but um, we're putting things together and, and hoping that it'll come, come good for this year and, and next year. I think uh, it's time we got back into it. And, some things. Really exciting uh, that AOS the uh, TV channel on Sky, channel 186, I believe. Uh, also, screening Johnny Clark's top tier show uh, where uh, Mihai is out next on the second. So, uh, great opportunity to see some fights for free. Yeah, um, you know, September the second, Mihai will be out on, uh, on uh, top tier. Uh, John Clark, I think, is a great promoter. I think he's come into the boxing with a, with a business brain, looked at it, said, what do I need to do? He's done that. He's done some tremendous shows. Um, so we're really looking forward to screening those shows. and We're looking forward to to highlighting the fighters that he's got on the shows. And uh, it's a great card. It's 50-50s almost all the way through the card. And that's very, very rare. But that's, that's, you know, he's taken a stand, and I very much admire John for doing that. Uh, he's taken a stand, I want 50-50 fights, and if you don't want a 50-50 fight, go on someone else's show, don't come on mine. So, you know, yeah, um, September the 2nd, uh, we're doing the undercard on the AOs at AFN, the AOs at Fight Network, uh, streaming, and then we move over for the main events uh, on Sky 186. Wow, and as you said, uh, your own shows will also be screen screened on the same channel. Yes, all, all of our shows will be on the AOs at Fight Network, um, as will other promoters' shows as we go as we go forward. Uh, we'll be streaming those shows and, and uh, moving forward with the times. Well, that's fantastic, getting that much more exposure because uh, there was a time when small hall shows, well, whoever was there got to see now. The, the world can see it. I think I think people have realised that that you've got to give value for money. You, you know, um, way back when you could put a poster up and people would flock. Then it became the biggest ticket seller, 
and um, you were looking at good fighters not getting fights. I think it's changing a little bit, rightly so now. Um, the public are demanding that they don't want the shit fights to be Don't get me wrong, any professional is entitled to have their own fights, but then they've got to go into the process and you, know, you can do 10, 12. And I blame a lot of the coaches, to be honest. Uh, I, th I think, as I say, everybody's entitled to those learning fights. If you keep them too long, then they're just ticket sellers and you use them. And you're not giving them the right fights, you're just giving them whatever's available. And when they come into a championship, they fall very, very short with the rest of the sport. So there's no real point in doing it. Um, Johnny Clark's got the right idea, big shot. Charlie Clark and top tier, they're putting on good fights. Indeed. And but I say it's important that those fighters who take those risks are rewarded and also not punished because if you fall short and lose, as you said, fight competitive fights, the chances yeah. are most fighters are gonna lose, that they do still get other fights and other opportunities. Absolutely. If you take boxing as a whole, we are over the years, uh, how many fights participated in this sport? Hundreds of thousands? Or how many have got a zero at the end of their career? Not many. So, a defeat does not make the man, and certainly does not make the boxer. Many boxers have learned that they have gone on and been better. Look at Canelo, who took that defeat, he became better. You know, I tell you, people who I admire um, that, that come through the hard way. You know, there's, there's a tremendous fight uh, at the moment with Boatsi and, and Dan Aziz. Now, I've known Dan Aziz I'm very, very close to Dan. Um, there's a man that wanted to be a professional boxer, came into this sport, learned his trade. And he did it. And we spoke way, way back at the old Peacock gym. We spoke and, and we said the traditional route, Southern area, English, British, and so on. And um, he did it. He did it the hard way. Now he's getting his just rewards. That man doesn't turn down a fight. You, you, you know, you look at the Boatsy and Aziz fight, obviously, everybody's got Boatsy as the favourite. I actually have. I've got. That was his fight. Not because, you know, he's very close to me, um, and I've been with him since the start, and I, but I admire the man, and he keeps his feet on the ground. Mentally, he is so strong. I'm not sure Boatsy is that strong, and therefore I don't know. Him in a There's a guy that comes from nothing and is a, should be a role model to these pros. He's taken risk. Okay, he's come through on scale. Great. If you don't, you rebuild. But he's taken a lot of risk. But look what he's got. And look what, you know, he's done it the right way. Yeah, uh, I like both men, but what a story it'd be if uh, Dan could get a crack at the ball. <laughs> Sorry? What a story it'd be if he gets that crack at uh, Dimitri Bivol. Oh, it's a fairy tale. You know, I mean, as I say, I'm, I'm biased because I'm a fan of Z's fan, and, and I, as I say, I've known him since before he turned pro, actually. Um, and to see him in the World Championship, you know, that would be fantastic. I'd love to see him. No, no offence to Boatsy, I've got no you know, people quarrels with him at all. I just um, I'm very biased towards Dan Aziz, but also that's that's with my heart and my head. I just think he's mentally strong. Well, that's what I've got to do with Boatsy. Well, let's see. Uh, was it October the 21st? Talking of mental strength, uh, I know you were there um, 
at the O2 uh, in uh, Brandon Scott's corner. Um, headline Andrew Joshua once again. First six rounds. I say the problem that's plagued him since probably the Klitschko fight. Hesitancy, unsure of himself. Uh, yeah, I mean, what, what did you make of, of it? Or is there hope that he's actually just still learning under Derek James? His coaching setup hasn't been ideal for much of his career. Oh, he's definitely still learning. Um, he, it's a crazy thing to say. The two time world champion, um, he's still learning. He is still learning, learning on the job. Um, he's had a couple of setbacks. I think there is a particular theme to those setbacks. I keep that to myself, but um, I think there's a particular theme to those setbacks. I think change of trainer, nothing wrong with it. Just for Fatten, but I think he needed to make a change to perhaps an old fashioned trainer. We'll give him better defence, we'll give him tools that he needs at that level. If you, if you, if you may recall when he had his little outburst with Lucy. Yeah. And, and the thing that I took from that was when he went over, he said, he asked a question, and it was a genuine question from the heart. I'm bigger and stronger than you. I'm the bigger man. How did you win? And that was his question to Lucy. And they'd say back, Maybe not word for word, but that was the genuine feeling, you know. I'm bigger, I've trained harder, I've trained longer, I've trained. I'm stronger, why did I not win? Um, Robert Hellenius, last minute replacement. I think with AJ, um, I was a bit worried when uh, Gilly White was, was pulled for, as we know, various reasons. Um, he has to go and deal with that. I was a little bit worried because I don't believe that, he proved me wrong, but I did at the time believe that AJ deals very well with, with last minute changes. Um, yes, he was hesitant. I think the crowd maybe expected a little bit too much from him. He's rebuilding. He's got to be given that opportunity to rebuild. And as, as Eddie has said, you know, Look at his career, look at his sport. Uh, he's been in with, with some great fighters and come through. Whether he's lost that edge, I'm hoping not. Um, but he's got a lot to, to work on. Not just in terms of boxing skills, but mentally. He's, the mental side of boxing, I think he, he needs to work on that. Uh, because I don't, I don't think he's quite right. And I'm saying that with a good heart because I want him to be back to where he was, but more skillful, and going through these learning fights. The problem he's got is he's not being allowed these learning fights. Whereas others like Tyson, you know, when he come back here, I think it was a two or three fights, um, Tyson's one of you know, his world number one. He's got a skillful, skillful boxer, one of the most skillful. But he's managed his career better. You know, when he's down, he had his problem and given him an easy fight, easy fight. Then took the chance of, and, and got Wilder. Or he got three, as most people do. Um, so AJ, yeah, I think it was great to get that knockout. I'm hoping that gives him the confidence to go on. Uh, I'm sure it will. He's got a good trader, he's got a good team around him. They just need to allow him now to, to work it out and, and push forward. I need your opinion on this because, uh, you know, us media people, we get into all sorts of debates online um, about a potential AJ Wilder fight. Um, I've been trying to argue that it's not as one-sided as a lot of people think. It seems to be based on AJ's apparent hesitancy. Uh, I'll try and make the argument that, well, actually being cautious surely will make him harder to knock out, not easier. Um, Vlad Klitschko arguably made a championship career out of being cautious. Uh, can you, as a coach who understands it, 
what, what's your opinion? Is he more likely to get knocked out if he goes in cautious? Because some people look at the way Fury beat Wilder in the, the rematch and say, you know, you've got to be aggressive towards him. Uh, what, what's your view? Correct me as a, as a know-nothing fan. I think, um, let's take, sort of take a minute back. Um, Tyson against Wilder found out a lot in that first fight and discovered inside himself what was Tyson not I don't think anybody else could say Tyson worked that out himself very very high boxing IQ probably the greatest I've come across in, in my time in the sport he was very knowledgeable and he worked it out you know take the fight to him be aggressive he's never been on the back foot put him on the back foot and be aggressive, and look what happened. Um, you mentioned Vlad, where well, you, you, you've obviously got Vladimir and Vitaly. Vitaly took, took was, was very, very cautious. Vladimir took the, more, the most risks out of the two of them. And as the, 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 the great man himself, Manu Stewart said, if I could teach him the hook, I'd have tremendous boxers. <laughs> Excuse me for that. Um, Vladimir was careful. I wouldn't say he was too cautious. You know, he, he was careful, picked his opponents, um, did the basics, absolutely spot on. I think if AJ boxes too cautiously, then the fight fights white. I don't think he can be that cautious. Obviously, he's got to be wary of you know, that hammer that, that Wilder has. But I, I, I actually go with, um, with with AJ beating Wilder. He's, I think what Tyson did to him, come back to haunt him. Um, and he knows that AJ has that power. So he's going to be cautious. So I don't think it's as one-sided as people are thinking. As long as AJ fixes the problems he's got, which I think he's on the way to doing, doesn't box too cautious, safe, but not cautious, uh, and we get a glimpse of the old AJ, and he can knock Wilder out. Well, that's, uh, if it happens, uh, I guess uh, now it's for those Saudi princes, uh, I guess, to, to put the money up. Um, well, the money is just, you know, no fault to them, I'm glad they're getting it, you know, but it is bloody obscene, isn't it? Yeah, it's not even for a title, so, um, hey, but... I don't actually think, you know, everything should be for a title. Some of the greatest fights in history, if you look back, not title fights. You know, we don't have enough of that. And in this modern era of boxing, you know, everybody puts a title on something. Everybody wants a belt. Look how many belts there are. You know, it's like going down the market and buying a, what do they call those things? The, the, jamboree bags or wherever they were and picking out a belt, I will box for this one. You know, it doesn't have to be. A great fight is a great fight. There should be more of it. Indeed. On that note, yeah. Um, Mervyn, absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me down. Welcome to your gym. Um, just a reminder, it's October the 13th, back at Bedford. Some of your, or well, Nearly all of your stable will be out, so uh, get behind that local show. Give us the final word. Yeah, thank you for coming down, and thank you for talking to the boxers. It's been a great day for them. Um, and at the end of the day, it's about them, not, not anybody else. Uh, looking forward to the 2nd of September on Johnny Clark's top tier show for Mihal. Um, top, top of the bill there, and rightly so. I think you know, he deserves that. And October the 13th at Bedford for some of our prospects. So we're putting a few of our prospects on there. And um, then we'll be announcing our November and December shows within the next couple of weeks. Mervyn, thank you for your time. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in a few weeks.